ታሪ ጋራ ተደራድራቸዋል ለተባለው ከዚህ ቀደምት ላይ የመዝረክ ሲነሳሳማለሁ ያው የተከበረው ምክር ቤት ያወጣችሁ ታዋጭ ካሸባሪ ጋር አትደራደር አይልም ካሸባሪ አታሰልጥን አታስታጥቅ አትደግፍ ነው የሚለው እኛ ህጉን ተከትለን አስተጣጥቅንም አልደገፍንም አላሰለጠንም ህጉ ግን አትደራደር ስለማይል ሁለተኛው የዓለም ለምን ማይጠቃም ይሆናል አሜሪካ ታሊባንን ለ20 አመት Welcome to EOA News in collaboration with Hagara Media. I'm Hermela Aragawi. That was Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed addressing parliament for the first time since Ethiopia peace deal between the government and the Tigray People's Liberation Front was signed in South Africa earlier this month. Ahmed addressed many issues including the economy, food security and education. But what a lot of people were eager to hear about though was his perspective on the peace deal that was signed in Pretoria. And in that clip Ahmed addresses why the government sat down and negotiated with the TPLF which is designated a terrorist organization by Ethiopian parliament joining me to discuss this and the latest developments on the peace efforts in Ethiopia is Ethiopian American legal analyst Dereja Demese Dereja welcome We're we're going to get right into it uh your mic's up yeah we're going to get right into it now uh You know, what do you make of that explanation of why the government sat down with the TPLF which is designated a terrorist organization by Ethiopian parliament and there's an old adage I can't even tell you exactly where it came from that you know the US doesn't negotiate with terrorists which is something that people have said when it comes to the TPLF in Ethiopia. Yeah, so I think he uh stressed the fact that he has always tried to uh negotiate uh a peace agreement and resolve the conflict peacefully even from the beginning of uh, the conflict prior to the TPLF surprise attack on the Ethiopian uh, federal forces stationed in Tigray uh, he laid out the series of steps that government took to in an effort to avoid conflict So uh, the way he presented it was that the peace deal is a continuation of the government's effort to resolve the problem peacefully. He um after discussing the number of steps the government took prior to the uh eruption of the conflict he talked about the at the various stages the government uh declared a ceasefire and made peace overtures which were not accepted by uh, TPLF and its combatants and um he described the suffering of the people and this is horrible this is not something he's saying for the first time by the way he has said many times that he would rather negotiate for 10 years than fight for one year i think that's a, a direct quote if i may be mistaken about the duration uh and he said repeatedly that uh, the country was willing to negotiate without preconditions and so this was not a new thing for the government to make this this overture but uh, he also um laid out what the red line is for him which is if the integrity of the country or the unity of the country is at risk and i think this is a rare point that uh, uh has been made by a prime minister of ethiopia at least since um tplf or eprdf took over we don't hear the word unity being used by an Ethiopian leader and in the past several years since Abiy Ahmed came to power he's consistently emphasized the need to protect the unity of the country and uh, of course the territorial integrity of the country and he said so long as those two things are in danger or at risk he would he would go to war but if he's able to preserve the unity and integrity of the nation uh, he would then engage in any type of peace negotiation to avoid conflict so um i think it's consistent it's a consistent message something the ethiopian government uh, media and other international media have not covered 
the various efforts that were made to avoid the conflict to come up with a, a peaceful resolution prior to the, the start of the conflict in November 2020. And since then, the various uh, ceasefires and peace overtures made by uh, the government. Let's talk about some of the recent developments. There was the original peace deal that was signed in Pretoria uh, around November 3rd. It was pretty straightforward. It was between the Ethiopian government and the TPLF. It included uh, an element about disarmament of TPLF combatants. And then we saw what uh, you have referred to as a subcontract signed in Nairobi uh, this past weekend. Um, and in between those two things, there was this issue of the TPLF uh, isn't represented by the people that showed up in South Africa, even though there's a document that says that to the to president of Tigray, Deborah's own sent. Uh, and then there was a, a, a claim among the, the diaspora saying that the Tigray Defense Forces are actually who's the one that's fighting on the ground. Um, and so it appears there seems there, there's some wordplay going on how important is this uh you know and, and to that same point there was something that came out of the state department today that referred to the tigray defense forces which is something that a lot of ethiopians say they don't recognize these are tplf combatants tplf is the only entity that they recognize so how important is what the terminology that is used uh in the documents and it being consistent yeah so this is uh a very tricky situation, right? You have a government that doesn't recognize a rebel army as a legitimate government of part of the country. Uh, in fact, that's a very reasonable position to take. If, for example, the state of Massachusetts goes into rebellion and takes itself out of the federal government and raises arms and start fighting, if you negotiate with that group, you treat them as a rebel army, not a legitimate government of Massachusetts. Because a state cannot exist in a federal system as a legitimate state unless it's recognized by the federal government, right? So once the Tigran government, the state government of Tigray that was in existence prior to the armed conflict, goes into rebellion, it becomes a rebel group. And at that point, you can call them by the party's name because that party controls that area and chose to arm the people that it instigate, instigated to rise up. Or you can call them by a name they gave themselves, which is the Grand Defense Force, for lack of a better term. Uh, or you can call them combatants, but you the government legitimately raised the issue that we can now call you uh, to government of Tigray because you're no longer recognized by the federal government as government of Tigray. You're not. So if you're not government of Tigray, then what are you? You uh, look to us like you are TPLF because all of you either are current members of TPLF or former members of TPLF who allied yourself with the party TPLF that used to be government of Tigray and is no longer because you are now in rebellion. So we're going to call you TPLF. Uh, no, they wanted to be called different things. But then today we got an explanation from BBC interview of uh, uh, Togetacho Redda that he they decided basically, OK, call us TPLF because we don't want to lose the uh, we don't want to not have this peace deal because we can't agree who we are. And so they went with TPLF. Once they went with TPLF, their supporters raised a lot of objections saying, you're not TPLF, you don't represent the um, combatants. They are TDF or something else. Then they sent the TDF army commander to negotiate with the Ethiopian army commander. And he was then in Kenya having the same problem. Because if you're a Tigrayan Defense Force, the Ethiopian government doesn't really recognize this such thing as a Tigrayan Defense Force. It's uh, a militia, rebel militia organized by TPLF. So 
to avoid the dilemma of calling those people TPLF and causing more problems for the peace deal negotiators, they agreed to call them com uh, armed combatants. But the point of the point is, when you're doing international negotiation like this and enter into some type of international agreement, it doesn't matter what name you use. Um, because ultimately you're not going to court and say, that's not me. It's not a legal, uh, you're not allowed to have a legal maneuvering where you claim mistaken identity, right? It's not, it's not a situation where you can say, that agreement was not signed by me. Uh, I'm a different person. Uh, I used to be that. I'm here. No, you can't do that uh, because the people who are in charge of the negotiation process, the African Union and the international community, is well aware of the fact that these people were organizers of the rebellion. So we're negotiating with the organizers, leaders of the rebellion that controlled the combatants that were organized by them, armed by them, supplied by them, fed by them, and the commanders who received their who received orders from them so um, it's almost as if if you have uh, in a criminal case for example someone using a name John something Smith in California and then comes to Massachusetts and uses Ernest McCain it doesn't matter it's the same person you are liable for what you've done in California, you're liable for what you've done in Massachusetts. And if you go into a plea agreement, you are the same person. Again, you're not gonna say, I'm there, you know, I'm so-and-so there, I'm so-and-so here. These are the same people. They were involved in the same conduct. They were involved in the same transaction. They were involved in the same conspiracy. And we're negotiating with you in this capacity or that capacity you can come as a, com a commander, you can come as TPLF, but we know we do the same people. So I, I think all those maneuvering is for political consumption, mostly for to placate their supporters who are disheartened by the fact that there's this peace deals instead of TPLF taking over, you know, Addis Ababa or something. So um, I don't really give it that much credence. Uh, it's again, it makes their uh, life a little easier to tell their supporters who would like to believe in all kinds of fantasies that are, you know, they're, they're fed. Uh, I mean, at this point, they've said so many different things. Um, I don't even know how people can believe uh, when, when, when you hear some, you know, when, what they say sometimes, it, it baffles the mind how you can actually have so many inconsistent positions and say so many inconsistent things with a straight face and still have people believe in what you say. It's, it's, it's incredible. Right. And, you know, there's, there's a sense that right now everyone's sort of sitting on hope. There's no reason not to assume that these, this peace deal is actually going to lead to a peace deal. But I think uh, the concern among many Ethiopians and Eritreans is that this can is being kicked down the road. The disarmament element has not kicked off yet. What was signed in Nairobi um, over the weekend said that uh, the, the TPLF leadership, the Tigray leadership that was there um, representing Tigray or the combatants in Tigray would return to their positions as Gita Chorada, the spokesperson for TPLF has uh, in the last 24 hours and then they would orient their forces for seven days basically let them know what is going on and what they need to be doing and then disarmament would begin on the eighth day for uh four days with different locations for disarmament so that sounds i think good for a lot of Ethiopians and Eritreans who want peace but what happens if we get to that seventh or eighth day and there's some sort of more of a kicking of the can down the road and what could that look like yeah so uh several things can go wrong but i think the most important thing is the time frame is not is not um 
huge. I mean, we're talking about seven days. Um, and then four days following that where disengagement happens. And disengagement is pretty much described as the combatants going into four separate camps. And, um, and after that, they would be disarmed. Um, they would give up their arms and go into some type of rehabilitation and reorientation process. So I don't think we are going to look at another extension. And listening to the spokesperson today, just reading what he, uh, Getacha Redda said to BBC uh, journalist, it looks to me that uh, they've pretty much decided this is the course to take and um, that they're committed to this process. Now, whether or not something would, you know, changes between now and the next week, that's possible. But um, again, in any negotiation, uh, things go awry or um, one party reneges, uh, especially when that party believes doing so would benefit them. And at this point, I don't know what that benefit would be to TPLF or its leaders if they uh, renege on this on this peace deal. The biggest thing going for them up until now was the backing of the international community uh, through the many diplomatic efforts they've made. And the pressure on the Ethiopian government, again, by the international community, again, because of the diplomatic work they've done. And um, that is going to be something they would not have if they are deemed to be uh, a disruptor of the peace deal. And the Ethiopian government has a, an upper hand militarily and that's very clear from the interview of Getacha Redda, where he basically said, we don't want to uh, lose the chance of uh, entering into this peace deal. So we accepted many uh, of the demands made by the government. So why come all this way to only renege a week later? I, 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 you know, I doubt that would be the case. But again, there would be many elements uh, that would oppose and uh, this process and they would, would, would try to do uh, whatever they can to derail it. And the Ethiopian government has tools in its toolbox to deal with that, particularly in the designation of, uh, in the revocation of the designation of uh, terrorist designation of TPLF. They can, and also in the upcoming law on um, transitional justice, they can put provisions in both, which allows the government to single, and out, single out individuals who disrupt this process uh, to, be to be subject to the regular criminal court proceeding, as opposed to the transitional justice system. They can also uh, revoke the designation of TPLF as a party but then maintain a subgroup of TPLF, who those groups that refuse to abide by the peace deal. So um, there are a number of things you can do, but it requires a lot of effort also diplomatically to make sure that the government has kept its end of the bargain. You can't do these things if you don't follow through yourself. But if you're in full compliance and if the other party does not perform, and you can identify specific elements within that party that are uh, working to derail the process, then you can fashion a legal uh, structure to deal with those people separately. And I think that would be uh, a very, that would send a strong message to those people who think they can do stuff like this and would allow the government to deal with it. One of the things that I always find fascinating when people are analyzing something like this is how people read into what isn't said, right? People have different interpretation of, of what isn't there. Uh, and, and one of those examples is in the latest subcontract that was signed in Nairobi. Um, it, it mentions uh, that 
um, foreign forces and non-ENDF forces will lead that region. A lot of people read the regions and say Tigray, but as you've mentioned, it actually doesn't say that word in that context. It doesn't say it's Eritrean forces when it says it's um, foreign forces, but it, of course it's a natural uh, uh, thing to assume, I think, to, to, to assume that. And then others went as far as to also um, assume it would be the Amhara regional forces and any final militias that were in presumably the Tigray region, but it just says the region. So can you break that some of that down for us and what it does and it doesn't mean and what it could mean? Sure. So I referred to it as a subcontract for lack of a better term to just make it uh, simple for the Ethiopian audience. But what it is is an implement implementation contract. So implementation agreement. So you have a general agreement, a peace deal, that provides the framework for how the peace deal would be imp implemented, but leaves out the detail of the implementation for future, future negotiation by underlings. The underlings here are the re res respective military commanders who actually are better, in a better position to know what is required to disarm, what is required to disband, uh, disengage, and reorient people, right? So the civilians who went to South Africa didn't want to get bogged down in all the details of disarmament, disengagement, orientation. So they left it to the army commanders to get together and iron out the details. But one thing you need to know and everyone needs to understand is when you work in this framework of a larger legal agreement and you're trying to come up with implementation, you can't alter the original agreement. Your, what you can do is provide additional specifics on how you can implement the provisions that pertain to you. So in doing so, they've again, engaged in some political back and forth. And between the Pretoria agreement and the Kenya meeting, there was a lot of pressure on TPLF leadership uh, from TPLF supporters in the diaspora, a lot of opposition, especially uh, around the fact that Eritrea it was not even mentioned, Eritrean forces were not mentioned at all in the agreement. Uh, for the past several months, TPLF leadership has been telling people that Eritrean forces are present in Ethiopia, and Ethiopian government has not said anything about it. So you can imagine, and I think there's some hint of this from uh, the interview of uh, Getacho Redda, you can imagine the TPLF uh, army commanders or the combatant commanders uh, wanting to have the agreement say something about the Eritrean army to placate their supporters. And the Ethiopian representative saying, we don't want Eritrea to be mentioned. They may even say they don't exist. So what happens in this situation when you're uh, in a legal negotiation, when part one party says, I want this to be mentioned, another party says, that doesn't even exist, so why do you even why do we even include it? The facilitators would say something like, "Why don't we put foreign uh, army or fo foreign forces, not mention Eritrea or anything else? That satisfies your supporters, and you guys, if the Eritrean force is not in Ethiopia, then don't worry about it. So, but this makes the process easy. So let's just go with that." And you know this kind of stuff happens in any uh, in, in legal uh, negotiations. Like you say to your client, "This is important for them. You don't care about it because you know what you're saying. Uh, they're not there. So if they're not there, why do you care?" Okay, we'll say foreign forces. You don't want to say it there. We'll say foreign forces. Fine. So it, it happened. But you know the, again. This is not a case where you go to court and tell the judge, you know, we meant foreign forces, this, Eritrea is present. The facilitators know what is meant, the why this is written the way it's written. There's a record of the stuff, right? And um, the participants also know. So again, this is for the consumption of the um, 
supporters. Why didn't they, for example, say from the Tigray, uh, from the state of Tigray? Because then that brings up all kinds of issues. So they didn't want to say that, and they would agree to say just region. These forces would leave the region. What is the region? Um, so they intentionally left it vague so that they can go to their supporters and say we meant this and then but know full, know full well that it's not what it means so they're giving themselves some wiggle room the ethiopian government made concessions to make their life easier so they can be able to convince their supporters ethiopian government has some interest in helping them convince their supporters so it may be even in the Ethiopian government's interest to facilitate some of this and, and not really uh, you know, oppose it strongly. So a lot of stuff like that happens in, in, in these to documents. Consider. And I think, to, yeah, to read so, so do you this think, as a do legal you... document is the wrong way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, like a, a right. legal contract. It's, yeah. Right. It, it sounds like to me that this, peace deal is not just between the Ethiopian government and the Tigray People's Liberation Front, but it also considers the diaspora that has been supporting the TPLF and all of this, who are incredibly invested, probably the Ethiopian and Eritrean diaspora as well, which is interesting um, that, that those, those entities are a consideration because in so many ways we said it's only the people you know, on the ground, whether it's the Ethiopian National Defense Forces, the Ethiopian government, and then whoever is in Tigray that is a part of it. But, but it seems to consider all the different um, stakeholders, I guess, in all of this. It's a political document as much as it is a peace, you know, it's a peace deal uh, that requires a cessation of hostilities and tries to accomplish certain political goals, but it's also written in a way that allows the parties to convince their support, respective supporters. Um, the disarmament was uh, mentioned at the top, and there's a reason for that. There is a reason why um, it is emphasized in a way it was emphasized with time frame and, and all those things. So, um, yeah, and I think both parties considered the, their respective constituencies and um, tried to accommodate each other to the extent they could. So another issue that was appear to be implicated in the in the document, but wasn't said, but was addressed by uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, is the issue of the Welkite region. Um, it, the, the word Welkite was not in the agreement that was signed in Nairobi, uh, but the element that said all non-Andia forces would leave the region uh, gave people the sense that that meant the Amhara regional forces and other forces that had entered that area um, at the start of the war. And in the State Department phone briefing, uh, they do mention, uh, you know, I don't know, they actually mentioned the issue of uh, Walkaif, but they do mention the Amhara regional forces being, ha having to leave that region. But what in his speech, what Prime Minister Abi Ahmed said is the Walkaif issue is an internal issue. So I want to play what he said about Walkaif and get your thoughts on that, if we can pull that up. Walkaif gar betayaz lansut iyaki ብዙ <laughs> ወዳማራይሁን Sidamana or Ita Blatet Yakalacho, Sundo Africa hit, Yasra, Lemudilan 
ቦታ አይደለም የተስማማ ነው በኢትዮጵያ ህግና ስርዓት ይፈጸም ነው ከሕገ መንግስት በፊት ነው የተወሰደው በጉልበት ነው የተወሰደው ላሉት የኔ ፍላጎት ያስተት እንዳይደገም ነው ዛሬ በጉልበት ነገት አገሰ በጉልበት ከሆነ ዘላቂ ሰላማ ያመጣ አመጣ ወልቃይት ብንፈልግም ባንፈልግም የተወላገደ አማርኛ የተወላገደ ትግራኛ የሚናገር የሁለቱ ህዝቦች ድልድይ የሆነ ህዝብ ነው ሁለቱን ቋንቋ የሚናገር የተጋባ የተወለደ ህዝብ ነው ወልቃይት የነቱን ነው አትንኩብኛለው እንጂ ከንግዲህ በኋላ ትግራይ የሚባል ጋራ ልገናኝ ማልነጋገርም አላለም አይችልም ቢልም ይሄን በሕግና በስራት ብንፈጽም ለወልቃይት ይጥቀማል ለአማራ ይጥቀማል ለትግራይ ይጥቀማል ሚጎዳው ነገር What do you make of the prime minister's statements on that? I think you can uh, summarize his statement in one in one statement basically that uh, this conflict is not about Wolgaite and if you want a second statement Wolgaite has nothing to do with the peace deal. And I think what he tried to emphasize was the parties that went to South Africa had no business or legitimacy to address the issue of Wolgaite. Uh another, put another way the stakeholders on the issue of Wolgaite are probably different from the people who showed up in South Africa. And if you were to deal with the issue of Wolgaite, you would have a completely separate different process under the constitution, a separate constitutional process um, that is consistent with the way similar issues have been addressed in Ethiopia and other in, in other parts of the uh, country. Um, issues that arose in other parts of the country uh, that have been addressed over the past several years have been addressed through the parliament under the Ethiopian constitution without involving any foreign uh, actors so um he's saying it's a completely local issue that is going to be dealt in a, dealt with in a very separate process the conflict has nothing to do with that issue it would not be addressed in the context of a peace deal and would not be even subject to uh, being discussed Having said that, uh, I think there was some discussion uh, by the parties and my understanding is that there was a side agreement, not agreement, but understanding that um, the area uh, in Wolgaite, uh, Raya would, be, would continue to be administered under the uh, Amhara I think the Amhara uh, region which uh, has been administering it or remains sort of uh, quasi independent and would not come under the transitional Tigray authority that would be uh, created in the coming months that's I, that's what I heard from uh, a report by Zabesha citing some sources who took part in the negotiation in in South Africa I <laughs> could be wrong but that's at least what was reported um so to the extent that it was raised uh, by any, by someone uh there was an agreement to take it out and at least have some understanding that it would be it would remain in a status quo situation and another issue i think that isn't uh, always explicitly said by ethiopians and eritreans but that seems to be the concern about only having ethiopian national defense forces in these uh, regions where there has been conflict and tension which in the you know in in an ideal scenario actually makes a lot of sense um but there seems to be a concern of whether the ethiopian national defense forces have the capacity uh to deal with all of the areas of conflict without the help of amhara regional forces or at some point and maybe still now um uh, eritrean forces in the country and so 
what would you say to that? I mean, what are what are the contingency plans? Because Welk Ait is, a, is in, in that region is a border area. The concern is it's a border with Sudan. There's been credible reports that I've uh, heard and saw documents that showed that they were um, uh, the TPLF was actually recruiting from some of the refugee camps or in Sudan. And so I think the border is a concern um, in terms of what can come in and out. So what are what do you think are some of the contingency plans if that becomes an issue? Okay, so I think regarding uh, the Eritrean forces, um, I don't have evidence the Eritrean forces are inside Ethiopia. To the, let's just assume they're inside Ethiopia for the sake of argument. If they are inside of Ethiopia right now, and there's total disarmament by the uh, combatants in Tigray region, then I think every Ethiopian that I know at least would demand that any Eritrean forces present in Ethiopia leave and they go back to the border. Um, there is no need for Eritrean forces to be inside Ethiopia and, uh, and particularly if there is no conflict and there is a disarmament, they would not have any concern of being invaded or their territory being coming to uh, being subject to some type of uh, incursion uh, by the TPLF forces. So um, I don't see the need, any need for them. Ethiopia has built a very strong army over the past few years. Um, it has a lot of experience in, in, in the battlefield. And I would say that uh, there's sufficient force to um, deal with whatever problems that may arise from some smaller contingencies here and there. Um, I'm not a military expert, but uh, usually what happens is uh, if you have a surplus or if you have an army somewhere else, uh, for example, the Amhara uh, army, if it has to go uh, to Amhara region, then it would free up other forces that are there and the Ethiopian army, the federal army, will have more, uh, uh, you know, uh, more resources to use for other areas. So I, you know, I don't think um, it's going to be a major problem or an issue so long as the federal army is in control of these areas, and we avoid uh, conflict in the Tigray region. I think you don't need to have. Amhara um, forces or other forces in different parts of the, uh, the country. Um, ultimately, there's going to be, um, I think, a need for a unified federal force. And uh, maybe you would have a National Guard type of situation where these various states have some, some type of uh, force that can be mobilized by the federal army that can be controlled by the federal army. Just like in the United States, for example, you have the National Guard that is trained. Uh, the National Guard serves, uh, every state has some National Guard and it's under the federal army. It's trained by the federal army, equipped by the federal army. And in time of need, it gets mobilized by the federal, by the federal government. Uh, but in terms of, in time of emergencies, the state governor can call the, the National Guard and they would help with emergencies. So I think you need to move to a, a, a system where the federal government controls the armed groups that are operating, whether under state or uh, whatever, within the country. And the states will have a police force to keep the peace. Great. Uh, there's some questions that are coming on YouTube, but I've got to sort of scan it to see if there's any good ones. Um, uh, let's see if the producers can pull a few. Uh, but in the meantime, I want to uh, follow up on your point about timeline and how important it is or isn't. You know, initially, the, 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 the initial document that was signed did appear very ambitious. I mean, speaking from my layman perspective, uh, it was really fast to disarm uh, whatever was left of the forces and then 
this sort of gives it a little bit more time. But ultimately, it was saying in 30 days, all TPLF or Tigray combatants had to disarm. And that does seem ambitious, seeing that for two years, they've been told a completely different narrative by those who were leading the war on that front. So how important is timeline? How should we approach it when we see new developments? How should the people of Ethiopia and Eritrea approach this um, as we move forward? I think timeline is very important. And that is something in any contract or agreement. In fact, uh, timeline is something that you can point to as uh, a specific deadline for a party to perform that triggers a violation of the agreement if it's not performed, right? So the fact that they provided specific dates I think it's extremely important and the Ethiopian government needs to insist on strict performance on the part of TPLF in adhering to the time frame that's provided. They give they give them some flexibility uh, uh, in the Kenya agreement and that may be a result of uh, the TPLF leaders in South Africa agreeing to a very strict timeline even though they're not able to deliver within that time frame and um, that tells you the kind of position they were in at the time they negotiated that, that, that agreement and then the commanders probably said to them this is impossible we need some leeway and you know sometimes you do give that leeway but in this situation time is of the essence and when time is of the essence, you need performance within that time frame because things can go wrong very quickly if you don't adhere to certain timelines as provided in the agreement. There's a couple of questions from YouTube we'll take before uh, uh, we wrap up. Uh, Kubra uh, Negus, the user of Kubra Negus says, as foreign forces leave, so do TPLF disarm concurrently is what the last document says that's different from the Pretoria agreement the user says the latter tantamount to precondition what are your views on that and I know you've touched on it but just to I think it's it's something that's on people's minds just to get that clear so this is an implementation agreement in, signed in Kenya that says that usually what happens is when the implementation agreement contradicts the main agreement that it's supposed to implement the main agreement, the terms of the main agreement controls. So whenever there is a conflict between those two documents, we resolve it by looking at the original document because you can't have an implementation document completely alter the spirit and the term of the original document. It's only, some, you know, the parties and the main parties have already negotiated and, and concluded a contract. They're giving the implementer some leeway to implement it but they can play there's a little room to play around but they can't alter it so if tplf comes back and says we're not disarming because uh eritrean troops uh, or that troop has not left this part or that part and we're supposed to do it concurrently this and that that's not gonna fly but because you go back to the original agreement that doesn't even mention concurrent withdrawal disarmament. So this is put in place again for political consumption. I think uh, you can't uh, actually practically do concurrent withdrawal and disarmament completely in, in tandem. Uh, you are going, you're talking about troop movement, you're talking about disarmament, you're talking about large number of people if they exist and how do you control the timing, right? So are you talking about concurrent? Is that the same day, same week, same month, same hour, same minute? So there's going to be uh, a lot of flexibility here. And um, once you start the disarmament process, you're not going to stop and say, has so-and-so left? And, and I think one thing the Ethiopian government needs to do is allow journalists to go in and document this process and if there is a claim that such and such group operates in such and such place they should be able to go and verify and, and report to the international community and the ethiopian people that 
claim is not accurate. So I think there's going to be a need for uh, robust and vigorous media coordination with the military and a diplomatic effort also to complement the two. Yeah, I think the issue of journalists is so touchy because there's journalists that go in with an agenda and then there's, you know, journalists who are actually trying to do right. But that does also... The Ethiopian uh, Broadcasting uh, Service has journalists, by the way. The Ethiopian English program has journalists. You give them right. a helicopter and send them places so they can, with a video or a cell phone, to record and show some of these things that are being repeated. Uh, for example, when... Uh, uh, Alex Dual uh, wrote on BBC a false claim that a drone attack was uh, carried out right after the peace deal was signed. Send a reporter to, the, to those places and, and show that it's, it's not true. It took three days for the Ethiopian media in DC to make a phone call to one of the negotiators to verify that is not true. And, um, you know, by the time that that was reported, the news has the news cycle has has gone, and uh, people accepted the claim of the drone attack as true. So there's going to be and there's a need for a very vigorous and vigilant reporting going forward. Yeah, there is a sense that you know the Ethiopian government just doesn't take all of the the the, the claims on the. TPLF, the Tigra activists, whatever you want to call them in the diaspora, those kind of claims uh, seriously. But yes, I, I think um, it is worth taking it seriously. But the issue of journalists also goes into the monitoring element of the peace deal that was in there. Um, I believe what it said was AU monitors could go into areas to make sure things were going according to plan with ENDF uh, protection as requested. What could that look like? So they are going to assign honors. Um, they, I would assume, mostly are interested in the delivery of humanitarian aid and also uh, medical supplies and the like. Um, the disarmament part, I think, is going to be done mostly by the military, but although that could be also something they would monitor if there's a problem, I doubt they would go into a area where there's an active firefight if something like that happens but the point is that if they need to go to a place to verify and look at the process the government would provide them protection and also TPLF uh, forces would do the same so uh, I think that's a good thing and again that's what the kind of thing you need to do if you see a violation, you report to that group, you make sure they're documented, and they see what's happening. Anything I didn't ask you that you think is worth noting when it comes to the peace deal? Uh, you know, I, I, I feel like there is a commitment uh, on both sides. Um, I don't know what the rank and file is um, thinking. There is this report um, report issued by the TPLF Central Committee that is trying to position itself as a separate group from its leaders, which is kind of comical because if you are a party and you have a executive committee or leadership that is carrying out the tasks of the party, whatever your principles or your agents are doing is imputed as if you know to you that you are they are your representative so now uh, the TPLF central committee is trying to say that it's different from its own leaders which is uh, you know I don't know a very comical situation it's almost like uh, uh, the prosperity party central committee saying uh, whatever Prime Minister Abe Ahmed is doing uh, is not authorized by us, or who cares whether they're authorized or not. It's, you know, they've already uh, nominated and confirmed these people as the leader of that party to who would speak on their behalf. And uh, so I think that kind of maneuvering sends the wrong message. It sends the message that it is okay to 
do things to undermine this process and that there is some undercurrent or some movement underground that would uh, that is trying to gain gain momentum and uh, come out or with a position that is different from the position of the leaders that negotiated this peace deal or that they would come and join this group and then they morph into something different what we've seen so far is the same personalities recycling themselves and coming up into positions with different names but these are the same people and i think uh, people are trying to cut, uh, cut on and uh, it's becoming obvious that uh, this game is a little bit tired i think you need to be more straightforward you need to do what needs to be done to help the people uh, there's need there's a great need for peace uh, democracy true democracy in tigray uh, for people to uh, be empowered to pick their own leaders and uh, chart a new uh, more egalitarian society within and uh, within the region of Tigray where each individual is empowered to exercise their democratic rights as opposed to recycling the same people the same party with the same ideology that the people serves are there to serve them and their interest so um, I'm, I'm hopeful that that new day would come although in terms of that I'm less optimistic today than I were when I thought you know maybe TPLF would not continue to exist as a party it's going to exist as a party its role whether it's going to be constructive or the more of the same is the most uh, concerning aspect to me uh, I hope that there would be more parties and more democratic involvement and robust debate within the region of Tigray. Um, not everyone da you know, dancing to the same tune, following the same people, uh, and um, saying the same thing. Like uh, Mario Cuomo used to say, not the recent governor, but the older Mario Cuomo. If two people agree all the time, one of them is not thinking. So people need to have different voices different opinions and they need there's there's a great need for debate and, and hopefully that will come absolutely i'm curious what tigray can produce when there's actually space for people to be individuals as opposed to be a part of the group think deraja demise legal analyst thank you so much for your insight we'll see you next time thank you thank you for having me all right, thank you everybody for tuning in. You're watching EOA News in collaboration with Hagara Media. I'm Hermela Aragawi. We were discussing with legal analyst Deraja Demise the latest developments on the Ethiopia peace deal. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed had addressed Parliament overnight uh, for the first time since the peace deal was signed in South Africa and after the uh, implementation deal that was also signed in Nairobi. Uh, legal analyst Deraja said that he is generally optimistic and it gets a sense that there are there is commitment on both sides a, a word that i have heard that i think is um a good descriptor is to be vigilant uh but to be optimistic that peace will sustain uh please support in um please support independent journalism uh, by going to eoanews.com and hitting donate, or you can become a member of my Patreon by going to patreon.com slash Hermela TV. Uh, big thanks to Hagar Media for uh, helping produce tonight. And thank you all for tuning in. Make sure you like, subscribe, and share this link so others who didn't join us live can uh, look at it. Thank you. Good night.